This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. We often don't really understand why we've been led down a certain path until we get to a destination, only to find out that that's just another signpost on the way to yet another destination. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me is a uh, guest who is uh, first time on this program and is an honor to uh, welcome him here. He reached out to Sharon and me a little while ago and uh, just expressed some appreciation for the humble efforts that we put forward. But uh, in reading his books, which he graciously shared with us, uh, I can see that his life experience is uh, far, far deeper and richer than my own. And so, again, that's why I say it's an honor to have him on the program. He is uh, a gifted leader. He's got a prophetic calling on his life. He served as a youth pastor, associate pastor, evangelist, pastor, teacher, tribal leader, recording artist, and author. Uh, As an enrolled member of the Blackfeet Nation of Montana, he has written... um, Somewhere in Montana, a spiritual awakening in Blackfeet country, supernatural awakening, a prophetic word has been released, and his most recent book, The Secret to Your Success, We Are the Generation of Revelation. It is my honor to welcome to the program for the first time, Bill Old Chief. Bill, thank you for joining me tonight. Hey, thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. I just... Very interested in your story, and as we talked before we we began the session tonight, you kind of... uh, uh, laid out some parallels between the experience of the Blackfeet Nation and the Jewish people, um, both of whom have um, suffered under the power of, a, of another government authority. Um, but it, it is uh, different in that uh, while the, the Jewish people were, were brought back to God, who brought them out of Egypt, um, there's been a, uh, as you put in the title of your first book, the subtitle of your first book, a spiritual awakening in Blackfeet country as uh, revival broke out there uh, 75 years ago and has spread throughout the uh, the Blackfeet nation. Just for people not familiar with this, as I was not, um, how did that happen? Well, uh, from, from the stories that were told to me uh, from uh, different ones, um, we were just like every other Indian nation. Uh, I often say this, that uh, there's the non-Indians just put us into one cup, and they say, okay, this is all the Indians, you know. But um, there's 556 federal recognized tribes in the United States. There's another 150 or, or more that are just state recognized. Each one of those tribes has a different dialect, a different language, a different... Uh, way of worshiping the Creator, and um, so so it's like trying to say the Irish, Jewish, uh, German, French—they're all the same, but they're not. They'll tell you and they'll fight. You know that no, we're this is who we are, and that's the way Native people are. We're different, and as a Native person, I could tell a different tribal member, as they say, a mile away. You know, the way they look, the way they talk. Um, different uh, characteristics that come from them. So the Blackfeet were just uh, in that same place of uh, disparity, poverty, you name it. Whatever whatever the, the negative word is, uh, they, 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 they'll paste it to uh, Indian country. That's what we were. And there wasn't much, unemplo- there wasn't much employment at that time. And the way I understand it is that uh, a young man uh, had a word spoken over him, a prophetic word in Idaho. And the word was, you're going to go back to your people. <clears throat> and in doing so, you're going to be a pastor. And I think he was like about 19 years old at the time, 1920. And that was the last place he wanted to come, is back to the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, because off the reservation... Uh, he was making a, a living for himself. He was uh, doing a work for the Lord and all kinds of different stuff like that. Because there was no Pentecostal churches on this reservation. I need to throw this this insert in there. And if I start running down rabbit holes, like you guys say, pull me out of it. <laughs> anyway, um, our reservation was divided between the Catholic and the Methodist church. So literally, it was split. Well... The Catholic became more aggressive, and, and uh, they kind of pushed the Methodists to, into the corner. They still exist here today, but uh, there's just a handful of them. So even the government 
decided what church we were going to be a part of. So there was no Pentecostal churches, so when this man had a word that came from a prophet, he took it and came, he returned home. Okay, all he had is his, his mother's house, which was a two-room uh, house eight miles west of Browning. And all of a sudden, one night, they were having a, a prayer meeting, Bible study. And then it, got, it, it just kind of began to, something began to happen. They couldn't really understand what was going on. It got a little bit more people start coming. Then all of a sudden, people start getting filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And that was really uh, a, probably a key point with the Blackfeet, because Blackfeet, I often say this, we're a spiritual people. We're not religious. We're spiritual. Maybe today there's a lot that may be uh, uh, religious, but in that time, people sought the Creator. And so in doing so, um, this man, their house quickly filled up to the point he tells, tells his mother, I think we've got to knock this petition out, this wall out. So they knocked it out. They moved all the furniture outside during the service, and then they just bring in a box of wood and planks of boards, and that's what they had their service with. And then so word began to spread throughout the community that something's going on west of town. And people began to just, just like as they follow Jesus, they began to go up to that house because signs, wonders, and miracles were beginning to take place. And this is what the Blackfeet could relate to. They weren't fearful of the Holy Spirit. They weren't fearful of the spiritual realm. They just accepted it. And I think by accepting what God was doing caused an even greater encounter with the Lord and all of a sudden, revival just broke out. And what would happen after the services would get over, maybe like 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, most of the men would go. There was a hill, hills just adjacent to the, the house. They would go up to the hills, and they would begin to pray. All night long they would pray <clears throat> until the sun came up. And I thought that's exactly what our ancestors did. Whenever they needed to hear from the Creator, what we say in Blackfeet, Apistatuki, Apistatuki is the Creator. So they would go in the olden times, and they would go seek the Creator for guidance. What do we do with the people? Do we go left, right? Do we, uh, you know, what, what we need to hear from you, Creator. And that's what these men began to do. They'd go pray all night long. Then they began to get into fasting. And that's when that explosion took place, and and probably the late 50s, I think, uh, was probably, uh, or early 60s, was when they built the first Pentecostal church here on the reservation, which was a log building. And that stayed there forever. Uh, the Assemblies of God came in and kind of put a pastor in there. But uh, that was kind of the birthing of it. And then within, we always say this, within Indian country, it's small. So... People from here began to take the gospel to the Crow Indian Reservation. They take it to the Flathead Indian Reservation. They take it to the Yakima Indian Reservation in Washington. They cross the line into Canada and take it to those reserves over there. So that fire just began to spread. It began to. It became unstoppable, and so today, it was like. The best example I could give, it was, it was like when Josh was told, Josh, in three days you're going to cross the Jordan. And as they begin to cross, God told, tells Joshua, now take from each tribe and have them take a stone and put that stone on a bank for a memorial. You know, not to come and worship it, but that you're going to tell your children. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to tell your children of this time. And that was kind of the essence of that, the writing of the first book, Somewhere in Montana, Spiritual Awakening. I thought, I need to leave a record for my children. I need to let, let them know that uh, this is where they come from. I often say this, if you don't know where you come from, then you're going to imitate somebody else. So if you don't know where you come from as a Native American, especially as a Blackfeet, then you're going to start acting like you come from the inner cities of L.A. or Seattle or, or, or Portland or one of those places, you know. But if you know who you come from, 
your family, your fathers, your grandfathers, you're going to say, this is who I am. This is where my roots go. And the same goes with our Pentecostal movement. It was here. I, I wasn't a part of it, but it was here. Uh, when I gave my life to the Lord, I, I encountered many of the people that were a part of that. Most of them are gone today, but they were people that knew God, not just knew about Him. They knew God. And so that's kind of the, the story of that that breakout of revival on the Blackfeet Indian Re- Reservation that went and touched all these other Indian countries. Hmm. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to interview a Lutheran theologian, uh, Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, who wrote about um, the spread of Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran Church in Madagascar, the island of Madagascar. And it, it struck me that it was uh, similar to what has happened among the Blackfeet and then th- how it's spread from there to, to the other nations, in that we of European descent have sort of de-supernaturalized the Bible. So the Norwegian and Swedish missionaries who brought the Lutheran church to Madagascar, uh, when you had a certain uh, witch doctor who, who understood what Jesus was doing when he was casting out demons, because he recognized those demons as the same spirits that they were worshiping and venerating as their ancestors in Madagascar. Um, when uh, Dr. Bennett went to Madagascar to write about the Lutheran church there, and he encountered a, a, a team of lay persons who had been trained to exercise demons. And somebody uh, at a, uh, the, the consecration of a new church building had uh, began to f- fall down and scream and froth at the mouth. And uh, these, th- this team went up and began exercising the demon. He thought they were having a joke at the expense of the, uh, the American uh, because we in the West have sort of de-supernaturalized the church to where we don't recognize these spiritual events that take place anymore. And that, that's why I, I really believe that because of our acceptance to the spiritual realm, that we walked right into it. We, we went into it and accepted it. Uh, when, I, when I gave my life to the Lord... That was just the norm. Literally, it was the norm. When the anointing would fill the, the, the service, a manifestation. If, if you were demon-possessed, those demons manifested themselves. And, and before I go any further, I need to say this. You're, you're right. The, non, oh, the Europeans have deluded the Word of God to the point, especially when it comes to the spiritual part, that, that it's, it's, it's just... Uh, a phantom to them to to accept that. I'll give you an example. Some years back, I was invited to Helena, which is about three hours uh, south of my place, for a men's meeting. So I'm doing the meeting, and I start bringing out things that were just common in our church, just just common. Now, this is a bunch of men, non-native men out there. And then uh, when we took a break, the pastor comes to me. I never had this happen to me. The pastor comes to me. He said, Bill, could you kind of tone it down a little bit? He said, uh, you're scaring the guys. And I thought, what do you mean? <laughs> Number one, they're men. You know, first thing in my mind, I'm thinking, you guys sh- should be warriors, you know. But you're afraid to hear just a simple story of, of somebody being demon-possessed and, and the power of Jesus Christ coming down and taking authority over that? I thought, I've seen a number of people that were possessed in God uh, deliver them, you know, within a church. And I thought, then it hit me after I left. I thought, <clears throat> what has gone on in the non-Indian churches to the point that they can't even hear a simple testimony about God's deliverance? You read it in the Word of God. And the thing is, is that I, I was just talking to a guy yesterday, we were talking about that the church has lost its power that the devil feels so comfortable, he just comes right in, uh, service after service. I remember one time when I first started singing, I first started singing, I learned how to play the guitar, and I started singing in church. It was a Friday night, the place was packed out, and I was singing one of those old church songs, I Know It Was the Blood. And as I'm singing the song, this guy just starts screaming, well, if I wasn't familiar with that, if I didn't know of anything about that, I'd probably drop my guitar and took off running. But I thought, I know what's going on. 
that spirit's manifesting itself because it can't stand the anointing. Mm -hmm. So I just kept singing, kept singing. Then he just drops to the floor, and literally he starts slithering like a serpent on the ground. Well, anyway, we prayed for him. He got delivered that night, and he continued to live his life for the Lord. So that was, you know, that's normal. I mean, I could tell you some stories that would uh, raise the hair on your neck, you know, uh, as a young Christian that, that, that we saw just, there was no evangelist in town. It was just us at the church. But God would show himself again and again. And as, as injured people, we, we know the spiritual part. We know the, the, the power within that. And then we're also respectful that we just don't dabble with everything. Like some tribes deal literally with witchcraft. They're, they're, they're really, even to this day, they'll, they'll put spells on other ones. They'll do all kinds of incantations and uh, to, to do things to other people. But the Blackfeet were never like that. The Blackfeet were always really uh, sensitive to the Spirit of God. Even before the missionaries came here, they were sensitive to the, to the Spirit of God. And my grandfather, my great-great-great-grandfather was the, was the leader, the chief, the head chief of our, what we call the Blackfoot Confederacy. And it consisted of 40,000. And the deal was... For 40-some years, 42 years, he led that confederacy. They wouldn't let him resign or, or, or step back. And I often tell people, your best leaders are going to, uh, in the Blackfeet government, are going to be not men of just intellect, but men that also uh, have the spiritual aspect within their life. And that's what my grandfather was. He was a man that knew how to pray. He prayed for the people all the time. But he was also a man, very intelligent, that knew... He foresaw, and one of his best quotes I like is, he foresaw that the days of roaming free were over. And he told the people, he said, the days of uh, using the bow and the arrow and the, the rifle are gone. He said the most powerful weapon we're going to have to learn and teach it to our children is education. He said we have to learn the white man's way. And that's what he began to gradually make that transition within his life and bring our people, because he knew we weren't going anywhere. The government had finally boxed us in, and we weren't going anywhere. We weren't going to go on any great hunts anymore, you know, our great adventures. Uh, the Blackfeet are known to travel when we first got the horse. Before that, they called it the dog days, because all we had was dogs and made the little travois on the back of them. Now we have the horses, the horses that got loose from the Spaniards. Mm, now right. we're exploring. And I often say that the Blackfeet, when I was uh, the chairman of the Blackfeet Nation, I discovered that we have Blackfeet in all 50 states and over 15 countries. Even Israel has Blackfeet. And the deal is, there's, it's recorded as far as down to uh, New Mexico and into Mexico, the Blackfeet were there because one man brought back the, the armament of the Spanish soldiers, and that name, the name they gave him was Iron Shirt. And I thought to myself, imagine that. They're gone a couple years. People just kind of gave up on him, and one day they returned back. But in doing so, that's the way we were. We began to go and seek others. So when it comes to the spiritual part, it just became normal for us, the hunger and thirst after God. And like I say, when I was told by the pastor, you know, kind of tone it down, you're scaring these men, I thought that was kind of funny because I thought, these are grown men. I'm not telling ghost stories. I'm telling the reality of what happened. But then it hit me. These guys have probably never heard this. They probably never experienced the power of God, never seen a supernatural manifestations that become commonplace when you begin to seek God. See, some, many people stand out in the outer court. There's a few that go into the Holy, the Holy of Holies, but just a few walk further into the Holy Place. And I believe when we hunger, we go into the, the Holy Place, and that's where we begin to see God. And the Blackfeet have always been those that go beyond the outer court. It's sort of like the uh, 
people of Israel have said to Moses, okay, we're afraid of God there, so you go up the mountain and tell us what he says, and uh, we'll just stay back here away from the mountain because he's scary. Yeah. Hmm. And that's, that's the deal is God can be scary. And, you know, I, I got a story. I won't tell it to you. I mean, tell it pri- uh, openly, but sometime privately, I'll tell it to you, and uh, you, you could do a, an assessment on it, but uh, it, it's... Um, it was one of those wake-up calls spiritually that um, that uh, really woke me up into the devil versus God, let's say it that way. Hmm. And God came out victorious, you know. So the thing is, is that even in my own experience, I got saved. I gave my life on a Wednesday night. I went into this church, and I remember telling my wife I was so hungover and sick and you name it, depressed on Sunday night. And I, I was looking towards the mountains. They were just cold and ugly, black clouds coming over them, and just everything that causes a person to be depressed, I was experiencing that night. But I realized that I can't run anymore. I can't run. I feel this tugging and my, pulling in my heart, and I told my wife, Muriel, find out where they have church in this town. I'm going to go. And anyway, she comes back and she says, well, it's Wednesday night. They're going to have it over a couple blocks away from us. Well, I've seen that church, never been there, but I've seen it. And we went in that night, and there was eight people in that church, eight elders, and one young preacher was preaching. And it was like those cartoons where one uh, shoulder the devil's on and the other the angel's on. And I'm sitting towards the back, and that ain't, that devil's saying, get out of here, get out, these guys are nuts, they're crazy, get out of here. You know, they weren't doing nothing, any anything crazy. And they turned uh, the young minister loose, and he uh, started to minister, and the angel said, Bill, just go up there, go up there. So even before I came to the Lord, I'm experiencing this supernatural uh, tug-of-war going on with me. And I literally jumped up, and I told told somebody later on, Man, you want to mess up a preacher when he's preaching? Run up there halfway in the middle of his message and give your life to the Lord. He didn't know what to do. He just kind of looked dumbfounded at me. And then he realized. And I remember I I had my arms up in the air, and I was just crying. And see, I was taught, you don't cry. You don't cry. Mm. Uh, You're puffing up. You know, boys don't do this and that. And as I was crying, I was feeling lighter and lighter and lighter. And I just couldn't. Couldn't believe what was happening to me. So Friday night, we come back. Now the church is packed out to the gills. It's completely wall-to-wall with people. And I'm sitting right in the front between these two elders, that old man and this old woman. And all of a sudden, they're singing, and I I hear this inner voice that says, Raise your hands. I'm going to do something for you. And I looked around, and I said, Hey... Wednesday night was all right, man. There was nobody in this church. But tonight, I can't raise my hand. I thought it was the most foolish thing to raise your hands. And again, raise your hands. I'm going to do something for you. And I thought to myself, how many times in the world was I a fool for the devil? Hmm. I did all kinds of foolish things that were just embarrassing. But I said, all right, Lord. I didn't even know there was a scripture pertaining to that. I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to be your fool. I'm going to raise my hands. And the moment I raised my hands, I literally felt this liquid coming over my hands. It was coming down this slow. It was being poured. And now I know it was oil, but it was coming down. And as it came and it hit my head, it came over my head. But when it came right by my mouth, by my tongue, boom. No man touched me. Nobody spoke to me. Nobody said to say this or say that instantaneously, on my third night of conversion, I started speaking in tongues. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And that was the most powerful thing that I experienced to that date, that time, as the Lord came and come upon me. And so, like I say that, you know, I've seen so many things in this walk that I thought I, I, I can't keep them to myself. I need to let other people know. Especially this time we're in today, 
There's so much fear. There's so much anxiety. There's so much uncertainty. People don't know what to do. And they're going to the church. And I heard a man say this the other day. It just blew me away. He said, the day of dead preachers laying their hands, oh, the day of dead preachers preaching to dead people in, in dead sermons is coming to an end. He said, because they're preaching in Jesus' name and it's coming to an end. And I thought, that's it. The people are hungering for the reality. They know they want the reality of God in their life. They don't want just another uh, 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 choir practice. They don't want just another little gathering and socialize. They want to know that, hey, I've been to church tonight. Something happened to me. Something took place. You know, you walk up. In many, many churches, you need healing, you're hurt, you're wounded, and you walk away the same way. But God wants us to begin to experience him, just as he told the woman at the well, you know, that, that he was, uh, who she was. He began to speak that prophetic word into her. That's what God wants to do in our lives. But we need to open ourselves up, and God, as the Bible says, the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. The Holy Spirit is like a gentleman. He gently leads us and guides us. He'll never push us into anything. And that night when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, nobody pushed me into it. Each time I yield to the Holy Spirit, He came a step further, and then finally He came into me. And that's why I get excited about what uh, God is doing and what He's going to continue to do. You've had some some real times of testing in your life, and you've been very open in your in your books here about. Um, falling away. Your, your father was a pastor, and uh, you, you admit that uh, you had kind of fallen away from that, and it took this uh, coming back. And uh, uh, I, I suspect that uh, you're very much like me, and that you've got a woman who, uh, in your life, your wife is uh, a very profound influence uh, on you, just as uh, my wife has been on me. But um, you've also had some real times of testing, um, some illness, physical pain that, that afflicted you for a time, and, and great personal loss. Um, right. One of, one of the things that a lot of skeptics will bring uh, against those of us who profess faith in Jesus Christ is that if God were, and this is an argument that the apostles, disciples were facing 2,000 years ago, that uh, if God was good, why does he allow bad things to happen? And, and so, you know, th- this is a question that we have to answer uh, periodically. How do you answer that, and what lessons have you learned through these times of personal trial and pain? Well, going back to my dad, um, he did. He was a part of that movement when revival broke out. And I often tell people, in our family, they, our, my grandfathers were all spiritual leaders on the Blackfeet Reservation. And they were the ones that did the sun dance. They were the ones that fasted. Uh, they were the ones that did all these things uh, with a tribe. So that's what they knew. They didn't know any other way. But they were good at what they did. That's why they became leaders. And so when the time came for my grandfather to transfer all what he needed to do to my my dad. Well, my dad goes up to the church, that church that night. And the reason he went up there was my cousin gave his life to the Lord, who is now today a pastor. He gave his life to the Lord. Well, my dad went up there because he was going to, he was so upset at my cousin for giving his life to the Lord, even though he didn't understand what it meant. He should have been a strong Catholic. That was somebody he was fighting for. He was going to go up there and beat up the pastor up there. But when he got up there, the place was packed out, and he couldn't get to the pastor. And I imagine had he got within hitting distance, he would have laid into him. That's just the type of guy my dad was. So what happens, the Holy Ghost got a hold of my dad. Okay, imagine this from the pulpit or from the platform to the first seat is about Two feet, just enough room for the, the preacher to walk back and forth. And two feet. Well, my dad was six foot tall. The Holy Ghost got him as he come to the front of the church. And he doesn't know how it happened, but boom, the Holy Ghost hit him. He wasn't even saved, but he got hit by the power of God. And when he comes to, 
not just my dad, but there was like four other people. They were all under the benches or under the, the planks of wood, and their feet were sticking out out of them. So my question was this, well, then, did somebody grab you? He said, there was no such thing as people grabbing you in those days. Well, did they drag you? He said, nobody dragged us under. Everybody else has fallen under the power of God. They were dancing. They were shouting. No one was even paying attention to us. We just fell. He said, and I don't know how we did it, but we fell, and we ended up under that. So right from go, he, you know, the supernatural hits him. He gives his life to the Lord, and he continues to go on. Well, as a young child, yes, I was, uh, with, the, with the, for a lack of word, I was forced to go to church with them, you know. But I never did give my life to the Lord. Just went because I, and I remember when I got into high school, junior high, I really began to rebel. And my brother and I, we got into high school rodeo, so we were cowboys, so you got to be a little bit tougher to be a cowboy. And in doing so, we were already hitting the bars at that time. We were already drinking, living the cowboy life, you know. So the thing was is that when people would would say, hey, is it? Isn't your dad Grayson Old Chief? They were just about ready to say that pastor. I'd say, no, my dad, and then I'd say my uncle's name. My dad is Howard Old Chief because I didn't want to be associated with anything of God. Mm. And I told God that myself. I said, I don't want nothing to do with you. I, I got nothing against you, but I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Leave me alone. Just let me live my own life. I don't want to be like those Christians. I don't want to be like those people. I'll do my own thing. And so I separated myself. And at 17 years old, I took off, and uh, my folks had to sign for me. I wanted to go into the Marine Corps, but they wouldn't sign. And finally I said, I'm going somewhere. My dad said, well, we'll sign for you for the Army. So I went into the Army. Never went home after that. I stayed away. And it was when I was 23 years old, <clears throat> I finally came to the point after running and running and failure and failure that I said I need to go to church. I, in the essence, what I was saying, I need to surrender my life to the Lord. Mm. And when I gave my life to the Lord, it wasn't just a, 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 say a quick uh, prayer and you're, you're saved. I cried out to God with tears literally coming down my, my cheeks. I wanted to never live that life I was living at that time. And as I begin to go, and the scripture says it this way, many are the afflictions of the righteous. It doesn't say many are the afflictions of the lukewarm or those that are cold in the Lord. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous. And all of a sudden, I begin to have trials and tests coming my way. And I thought to myself, hey, I thought this was supposed to be an easy life. Why is all this stuff happening to me? Why is these things taking place, you know? And I'll give you one quick story. One of the first ones that really, really impacted me, there was this guy that borrowed, when I wasn't serving the Lord, he borrowed a horse uh, bridle from me. And I asked him for it a number of times. He'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, he'd make excuses. So finally one day I said, I'm going to go get that bridle from him. And I was with my daughter at the time. She was probably about five years old. So when I went to him, he was in a crowd. And by then, now he's getting smart with me. And I thought, hey, buddy, you would have never even thought of speaking to me like that when I didn't know the Lord. And so I start crawling over the, the rails to get onto his side, and this fear came upon him. His eyes just got huge, and he reached down, and by the time I hit the ground, he had a board in his hand, and he whacked me on the head. Well, you know, a head wound, you it bleeds quickly, mm -hmm. and blood start coming all over. And I remember I reached, and I was going to, blast him. I was going to hit him in the face. And literally, just an inch from him, something grabbed my wrist. Literally stopped me. And we just stood there in midair with my fist, inches from his face. And it gave me time to refocus, to calm down. And I told him, you know what? You're not worth my salvation. Boom. I walked away. I didn't walk away and say, oh, praise God, I, I went through a trial, hallelujah. I walked away, and I remember going to my dad, and I told him what happened. 
And this is what my dad told me, because he was the old school. He didn't try to say, oh, Bill, we're so sorry for you. You know, matter of fact, you know, my dad was a prophet. He said, I thought he was going to call fire down from heaven to destroy this guy. <laughs> he said, Bill, I'm just going to tell you right now. He said, you haven't even got your feet wet. There's going to be many, many more trials. And that's exactly what began to transpire. Uh, loss of family, uh, sickness, all kinds of things begin to hit. And many, many times you ask yourself, just like this, this last major thing that hit my body, I'm out doing the work of the Lord. I'm out preaching. That night, just a powerful anointing fell upon the service. People were being slain and falling under the power of God. The word was anointed going forth. I didn't realize in two months I was going to be bedridden. I didn't realize I was going to lose 57 pounds of muscle, not body fat, muscle. I didn't realize that I was going to be uh, near death's door twice. And the thing is, is that, that as that sickness come upon me, you begin to ask questions. You begin to ask uh, the whys. And then you also begin to examine yourself. Because if I'm in the goal, Lord, I don't want nothing standing in my way. See, that's where the church is today. They're very... They got odd against each other. They're petty against each other. They won't release and forgive because this one did this to me and that one did that. In my life, I start saying, Lord, forgive me if I've offended my brother. Forgive me. I didn't want anything standing in my way. And it was one day I'm laying there in bed. Like I say, I bedridden. and I couldn't get out. People had to lift me out of bed. I was down uh, to 174 pounds for that. I was always about uh, 235 so I'm down to 174, and then I heard the scripture on television. One word from the Lord shook my spirit. And I, the word came out from Psalms. It says, you will not die, but you will live and proclaim the works of the Lord. I said, whoa, what was that? And I re rewound it and listened to it again, and I I. I Asked for my Bible, and I opened my Bible, and sure enough, there it was. That word caused me to start coming out. Not just that word, but a word from God. As I was laying there one night, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Bill, start taking communion. Watch what I'm about to do. I told my wife, we're going to start taking communion. I don't know if we take it every day or what. But I couldn't even hold a glass of tea. I used to have to drink tea to flush my food down because I, the muscle in my throat was gone. Mm. So my hand would shake with a cup of tea uncontrollably. I'd have to use two hands to lift it up. That night we took communion because Jesus said, remember what I did on the cross for you. I already put this sickness on the cross. I already put everything on the cross for you. Now watch what I'm about to do. That morning, I was sitting at the kitchen table, and it wasn't until my third <clears throat> drink. I looked, and I said, Miriam, look at this. And I showed her. I reached for my cup. I poured it up with one hand, controlled, no shake. It came. I said, look what the Lord did in one. We took communion one time. And so I continued on with that. And each time I did, the next following day, something would happen. And I remember when the Lord told me, okay, now you're going to get out of bed today. I thought, get out of bed? I can get out of bed. That's the first thing the flesh tells us. But the Spirit says, you're getting out of bed. So the Bible says, "By faith without works is dead. So I had to work my way just to sit up in bed. I didn't call anybody in. I just... Forced myself up, I'd bounce on a mattress until I was sitting up. Then I grabbed my legs, moved them off the bed. The walker was in front of me. And I thought, okay, now I have to get up. I bounced three times on the bed. I popped myself up, grabbed the walker. That was the first time in months that I was able to get up by myself. And I walked in the living room. Muriel about fell over. She was screaming. She said, Bill, you're walking. I said, I am. I said, here's the deal. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Because <clears throat> whenever God does something in our life, we should always be moving forward. 
We shouldn't be looking back. We shouldn't be saying, oh, maybe it's going to happen to me again. No, it isn't going to happen to you because he's the God of more than enough. He's God that, that is, uh, that, what's the scripture say? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I began to see that. And the other scripture that came to me said this, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you, Bill, old chief. <laughs> I said, whoa, resurrection power. And it hit me because it had to go into my spirit. And when it went into my spirit, boom, I said, that's it. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave abides within me. The same Holy Ghost that came upon me without me asking lives in me. Now that healing is going to come. God is going to bring it. And yes, I praise God for doctors. But I told the Lord, I thank you that doctors are helping on. I said, but Lord, in the end, I want to give you the praise and the glory. I want to tell people, look what the Lord has done. And that's just one of many, many things that God has done in my life that, that I can't deny the supernatural. I can't, you know, I'll just say this, and then uh, many people, they, they, they talk about Jesus being tempted. Oh, he was tempted like this, and the devil came and did this. But they don't finish reading the other portion of it. It says after, because Jesus used the word against the devil. And the Bible says after he was tempted, then angels came and visited him or ministered to him. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to be battling demons every day, get up and, oh, today is demon battle day. No, I want angels to come and minister to me. I want angels to lead and speak to me through the uh, 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 permission of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's what I want, and that's what I begin to see. And these guys that say every day, I'm, oh, I'm fighting the devil today, this and that, I'm thinking, man... Isn't that get tiresome? Doesn't it get tiresome every day going into battle, you know? But uh, we serve a mighty God, and that's that's the stuff. He, some of the stuff he's done that I just got to tell people, look what the Lord has done to this Indian man who grew up on a reservation, had no hope, no future. I could have bought into the lie that all Indians are going to get on alcohol and drugs and live in poverty. But I said, no, when Jesus Christ came into my life, boom, it broke that myth. And it said that I'm a new creature. I could do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And from that day forth, I said, I don't need to blame the white man anymore. I'm not giving the white man that much power in my life. I'm giving the Holy Ghost power in my life that God is going to lead and guide me. Too many times we're holding on. Well, the white man did this. The white man did that. Yes, maybe that happened. But I don't have to live that. I could see that this is what Jesus has done for me. This is the provisions he's made for me. This is how I walk with him and how I talk with him. And it carries over into my children and my grandchildren. Praise God. It's a... Uh really inspiring you you you're a musician as well i mean you you went back to school after dropping out of high school you got your uh, ged then you went back to school community college university of montana uh you're you're a published author now you've also got some wonderful praise music uh one one song in particular i emailed you about this because it uh, hit me on a day when i was feeling sorry for myself and uh, your song uh we are blessed uh just oh. that just really hit me um, but, uh, you, you tell me that, uh, your, your, your five-year-old grandson, uh, likes, uh, another one of his songs and, uh, really likes you to turn it up loud. Well, he, he discovered after you directed me to YouTube, I told my wife, I didn't even know I had a, a YouTube channel. <laughs> and tell, Derek, Derek, I said, here's the address. And, and so my grandson has one of those, uh, little iPads. Mm -hmm. So he discovered it on it. He he finds his own way through it. So there's a song on there. It's called Keep Me Strong in the Night. And it was the first song that uh, I recorded on my first CD that I'd written. So I had a number of songs that I'd written. I thought I'd better get these down on a CD because my voice isn't always going to be that strong or whatever, you know. So anyway, he discovered that. And, man, he plays that thing five, six, seven, eight times a day. And it's just strange to hear. So he grabs his guitar. I bought him a real guitar. It's a, a mini uh, Fender guitar. And it's just amazing. He'll say, he'll say, Grandpa, let me sing for you. 
So he puts his um, music on, then he's standing in front of me, and he's singing, he's going through the motions and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, this is a blessing to watch my little grandson um, like. He's not into punk rock and uh, uh, all this other junk rap, but he's playing gospel music from his grandfather, you know. And I think what it is, he senses, again, the anointing of God. Because when I when I record it, I didn't just record and say, geez, I got a good song, I got a good voice, I'm going to go and record. I went before the Lord, and I began to fast, and I began to pray. And I won't say how many days I fasted, because then, that, then you're taken away from that. But I fasted because I felt the Holy Spirit saying, fast, I'm going to put my anointing upon this master tape, upon this master recording. And whenever people hear it from the CD, they're going to sense that presence come out of it. And that was the reason I went into a fast over that CD, and then the, 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 uh, the CD after that, that I wanted not just to sell books or CDs, but I wanted people to know that there's, a, there's, there's, there's hope. There's hope. If you, if you, I often tell people when I get ready to minister, this man you're looking at is, is not the man I used to be. It's not the man. I didn't play guitar before I came to the Lord. I didn't sing before I came to the Lord. All that happened after I came it was all because I had a desire. I saw the, the guys playing in church, and I thought, man, I'd love to learn how to play guitar. And I, I, I tell this story, you know, I'd go to church, I'd, I'd watch them, I'd sit right in the front, I'd watch them, I'd learn one chord. Go home after church, grab my guitar, and I'd start trying to play that. And for about six months, I did that. Finally, I start hearing music come together. And the deal was, way down the road, after I got really good at playing and stuff, I kind of laughed at it. I thought, why didn't I just go up to the music store and buy a music book on the guitar chords? <laughs> but then I guess I could say, well, the Lord really did teach me how to play guitar. Because I didn't even that didn't even enter my mind, go get a, a guitar chord book. I just watch and I learn. And God began to give me songs. He began to bless me with songs. And that's why I, I really believe that in, in the prophetic, that music plays a powerful role. The Bible says when Saul became troubled, they called for David. Now, see, there's music, there's gifted musicians out there, but then there's anointed musicians. I always say, I'm an anointed musician. Hmm. That I see what happens when the music, when we're doing it live and it's coming out, and the presence of God is there. Ah, it's just amazing what God begins to do. And so it's that anointing. I often tell people, I don't, I don't have the best voice, but I do have an anointed voice. There's people that sing way better than me, could sing higher chords than me, but I have an anointed voice. And I know that when that anointing comes out, what does the Bible say? It breaks and destroys the yokes of bondages. I want chains to start falling from people spiritually. I want them to be hearing prison doors like Paul and Silas heard the prison doors kick open. I want them to hear that. I want it to begin to happen as this presence of God comes upon their life. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw in one more quick story. We just came back from Canada. The border opened, and I, the immediate time, immediately after it opened, they invited me to come up, so I went up. And just so happens, I'm ministering, and uh, I always tell people, ministers are really, they really like to exaggerate. They'll say, oh, man, the church we went to was packed out. And then you see pictures of it. It was like about a 8 by 10 building, you know. And uh, there was about five people in there. Well, this place was packed out to the gills. It was completely, uh, at least 300 people were in there. And, and, and the Spirit of God began to fall. And that one of them was with the music. As the music came out, people, and this is what I told the people, the fivefold, the fivefold ministry is in the house tonight. I said, we're going we're gonna to release. I said that the Bible tells us how, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. For there, it's like uh, Aaron, where the oil came upon him. I said, and as that oil comes down, now it's a priestly anointing. It's a priestly anointing. It's not just the anointing fall. Now this priestly anointing is coming. And I said, we're going to have a prayer line. I said, but this is what I want. I want the worst of the worst to come first. 
You know, most guys will say, those with colds, come on, we're going to pray for you. Well, I said, you that are in wheelchairs, you that are the worst of the worst, come up. Diabetics, cancer, you name it, you come up. We're going to pray for you first. And as they're coming up, you just feel the presence of God strong. I mean, this was two weeks ago. The presence of God just, just, it was amazing. It was just like a waterfall moving, like a tide pulling you in. And the, the people were... were rushing, and I told him, hold on, hold on, hold on, just just hold on. I wanted to wait for the right moment, and then when it came, I said, go. And as they began to go through the, the whole house, the whole church exploded. And it was like the book of Acts. Hmm. That night, and the next morning, I got two testimonies. I haven't heard the rest, but I, I had two first time I heard. The first one was this woman. We went to her house before we went to the church, she had four Bibles on her table, and she wasn't expecting us to be there. And she said, last night, God healed me. She said, I was going blind. She said, for months, I couldn't read my Bibles. I couldn't read them. She said, I used that magnifier. I used glasses. I couldn't read it. She said, but this morning, I woke up, and I, the, the, the Lord told me, read your Bible. She said, I pulled out a Bible, and I started reading it. I didn't even have my glasses on. She said, so I pulled out another Bible, and when it was all done, she had four Bibles out. She said, every one of these Bibles I'm able to read. And I was praising God. I said, thank you, Lord. The second one, this woman texted us. She says, I wanted to get to you guys after service, but I couldn't get up there. She says, I wanted to tell you guys, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, she said, so bad in my body. And I remember her because I saw three guys pulling her up out of her chair. Well, I didn't see her when she came to the prayer line, but when she came through, she said immediately, she said it was like lightning went from the bottom of her feet up to her knees. And she said it happened three, four times. She said, I just screamed, I hollered, I took off dancing. She said, and I thought, I'm dancing. I haven't moved like this for years. And she said, I just, it just the power of God just served. She said, then all of a sudden, I start hearing cracking and popping in my joints and my legs. She said, it was, even though the music was loud, she said the popping and the cracking was even louder. And she said, I just took off. I, I didn't feel no pain. I didn't, I was dancing. She said, and then I got drunk in the spirit. She says, and I'm walking back, trying to get back to my chair. And everybody that had fallen on or touched, she said, they would scream. They'd start dancing and jumping and hollering. And I thought, man, that's what we need. We need just a fresh flow of God coming in this day and age. He's not the God of the sweet by and by. He's the God of now. And he, if he's done it in me, he could do it in anybody. Hmm. Bill Old Chief is the author of three books, uh, Somewhere in Montana, Spiritual Awakening in Blackfeet Country, The Secret to Your Success, We Are the Generation of Revelation, and Supernatural Awakening, A Prophetic Word, has been released. I will put a link uh, in the show notes. And of course, you've been watching on this the QR code on the screen will take you to uh, Bill's Amazon author page where you can uh, get those books. Uh, Bill, where can people get your music CDs? Well, my music, uh, uh, they're, they're not out there. You'd have to mm. contact me personally, and you could can't contact me on Facebook. Okay. And it, it's crazy because uh, it's just Bill O.C., mm -hmm. Bill O.C., and there's a story behind it. When I put together my Facebook uh uh, you know, putting it together, every time I put in my name, it would come back, would say, we need a real name. <laughs> I said, a real name? That is my real name. <laughs> so I put lowercase, and you need a real name. I put all capital letters, you need a real name. I separate it, you need a real name. I put it together, old chief, you, you need a real name. And I was getting to the point, I was getting upset. I said, man, what's going on? Because I know other people have old chief, in their name. Why isn't this allowing me to put Bill Old Chief here? So out of frustration, I just put Bill O.C. And then I was just walking away, and I heard a click, and it said, uh, you're accepted. And I thought, oh, man. So I, I've, I've tried a number of times to go back and put Bill Old Chief in there, but it doesn't. So if you're looking for me, it's just going to be under Bill O.C., all right. Well, I'll put a link in the uh, in the notes wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast. Uh, a link to Bill's Facebook profile, and if you're interested, uh, do check it out. Uh, my, I, I know my dad who went home to be with the Lord back in 
uh, 2005. He would have loved your music, Bill. He was a huge rockabilly fan, and uh, especially your your second CD is is really r- almost rockabilly gospel. It's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. The joy comes through. And like I said, there was one day in particular a couple of weeks ago where I really, really needed to hear it, and uh, it just happened to be on the CD player in my car. That's why I'm not showing the um, on the camera here. I can show the books. I don't have the CDs because the CDs are in my car. You see, I can listen hey, in the car. Rob, what I did, I sent, um, I sent, um, uh, I just took a picture before we got on the air tonight, and I sent it to your phone. So it has the three books and the two CDs, and that's what I, I said, just in case you need this. Yeah. So anyway, you got that on your phone. But uh, I was just going to say, I, I don't know if I sent you my first CD. That's the one that has Keep Me Strong in the Night, They're the one that my grandson is always listening to. And if not, I'd sure like to get that to you. All right. Well, I sure appreciate it. And uh, we will definitely stay in touch because uh, this spiritual awakening is, is certainly, as you say, needed in this day and hour as we're getting closer and closer to uh, the time of the end. Um, the, the study, you know, I guess my calling is, you know, digging into these dusty academic papers so that normal people don't have to read them. But uh, without the spirit <laughs> married to that knowledge, it's uh, it's it's worthless. And uh, Bill, I, I just uh, really appreciate your ministry and your testimony and uh, really enjoy talking with you. Well, I just appreciate it, too. And uh, just excited to be a part. Uh, I, I just need to say this is that I was drawn to you. Uh, to Skywatch TV, and then I'd listen to your programs, you know, um, Sci-Fi Friday and uh, uh, the other programs that you had, because I'd never heard anything like that. I mean, I was into, uh, you know, certain things, and then when I heard you putting the, 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 the supernatural with the word, it just like, whoa, man, this is something I could relate to, you know? And... I got deeper into it. Next thing I I realized there was you guys, there was others of you, you know, that were out there that were on the same page and stuff. So that's why I I, I start uh, kind of checking you guys out to to because uh, I want to grow. I want to grow in um, in the Lord and, and know more about Him. And uh, I don't want to be left out. If there's a lot of good stuff out there that's happening in this hour, I want to be a part of it. But uh, that's why I was thanking God. I said, isn't it crazy how God brings us together? Yeah. We never went face-to-face, but there you are in Missouri. I'm here in Montana. And uh, when you uh, blessed me a while back, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to bless him in return. And uh, that that's never thinking anything about, you know, anything coming out, but right. other than just blessing you. And now tonight, get to be a part of your audience and uh, uh, what God is doing in your life. But uh, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, likewise, Bill, and uh, give our love to Muriel, and uh, we will continue to stay in touch and uh, keep you in our prayers. Okay, Lord bless you guys, and thanks a lot. Uh, and take care now. Lord bless. It's a fascinating story. Um, I find it really interesting because I can't speak to the experience of anyone in these United States who didn't grow up as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, obviously, but... Um, isn't it interesting that the kingdom of God is going to be a lot more diverse than most of us normally think about? Maybe that's what Paul meant when he said there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, Scythian or barbarian. Um, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Coming up, boy, there are some just really bizarre things in the news today. Some bizarre funny, some bizarre like Are you serious? To borrow a phrase from our good friend Paul Begley. Uh, Hey, take advantage of our new mobile app. We'll tell you about that and our new Roku channel as well. Much more ahead as a view from the bunker continues. The dark god plots and waits as the day is coming when he will be released from his chains to loose literal hell on earth. This most terrible time in human history is known by the ancients as Old Saturn's Reign. 
Skywatch TV is proud to present the Saturn's Reign Prophecy Package. When you order Derek Gilbert's new book, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker's book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy from the Skywatch TV store, you'll also receive Derek's mind-blowing 13-part video study guide for his new book, The Second Coming of Saturn on DVD, packed with paradigm-shifting revelation and a running time of over four hours. In his book, The Second Coming of Saturn, Derek speaks of a new age that began December 21st, 2020. Many experts pointed to the cosmic anomaly known as the Great Conjunction, a meeting in the sky of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, as the triggering event heralding a new golden age ruled by Saturn, the old god who once reigned over a world of peace and plenty. But it's a lie. In this groundbreaking book, you'll also discover why Lucifer is Saturn, not Satan, evidence that Saturn was the leader of the rebellious sons of God, the identity of Apollyon, the angel of the bottomless pit, the connection between Mount Hermon and the Mount of Olives, hidden Bible prophecies of God's final judgment on Saturn and the Watchers. Also included in this special offer, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker's new book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, where he details his upbringing as a young Jewish man confronted with the truth of Jesus the Messiah and how he unknowingly stumbled upon the ancient and primordial prophecy that is connected to every major prophetic event in Scripture. In 315, the genesis of all prophecy, you will learn how God's very first prophecy impacts every chapter of Scripture, see the catastrophic consequences of Satan's plan to eliminate the Jews, recognize how Satan's insidious and pervasive agenda has invaded every sphere of influence, be empowered by the Holy Spirit to play an important part in defeating Satan's diabolical agenda. But that's not all. In this must-have collection, you'll also receive the Second Coming of Saturn 13-part study guide. In this exclusive DVD, author and researcher Derek Gilbert personally takes you through all 33 chapters of his new book, The Second Coming of Saturn, and provides a deep dive into his research, including complete chapter breakdowns with ancient artifacts, maps, and other teaching devices. This tool provides hands-on access directly from the source. So Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of over $70. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So unearth the ancient prophecies of our Messiah and the rebellious dark gods as you discover the second coming of Saturn. This collection is available only while supplies last, so don't delay. The Saturn's Reign Prophecy Package, available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. Walking the Walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. That is our global hub as we uh, continue our slow progress towards total domination. Uh, you'll find us, on, find us on social media, Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. Facebook, View from the Bunker, and the other social meds, uh, Truth, Truth Social. We are there now. Truth Social, Gab Me, We Get Her Parlor, at Derek P. Gilbert. A uh, couple of conferences to tell you about in just a few moments, but uh, first, a couple of items in the news that I want to comment on this week. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine continued, and it is becoming obvious that it is the goal of Western political elites to drag this out as long as possible. This is frankly disgraceful because what's happening is the people of Ukraine are being sacrificed to weaken Russia's military and to weaken the uh, political power of Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I, I don't care who's right and who's wrong. I know we've got arguments on both sides. You, you make a comment about Ukraine and Putin is evil. You make a comment about Putin and, uh, yeah, well, what about Zelensky and the, the oligarchs behind him? Don't care. The people of Ukraine are the ones who are suffering, and elites in the West, Europeans and North Americans, are allowing it to happen, are wanting this to happen for a couple of reasons. I, I don't understand the spiritual war that has pitted the West versus Russia for literally centuries. But when you go back and you look at history, you could make a really good case that what's happening now in Ukraine is actually an extension of the conflict that uh, has manifested in various times and in various places like the Crimean War, World War I, World War II, etc., etc., etc. Something about 
whatever principality is behind Russia and whatever principality is behind the West, really knocking, just really dragging out this long extended conflict. And again, it's the people on the ground in harm's way who are suffering. And so I, I pray that this will end sooner rather than later. Pat Buchanan wrote a very insightful op-ed this week. I'll say again, the older I get, the more I realize Pat Buchanan was right about a lot of stuff, even though when I was a young, foolish man, <laughs> he frightened me. I thought he was he was farther right than Attila the Hun. Uh, no, Pat Buchanan just deals with reality. And uh, a lot of us prefer to see the world as we would like it to be rather than the world as it is. Anyway, America's interest, as Buchanan wrote this week in his column, is to end this war. Our true national interest is to end this war as soon as possible, rather than dragging it out, because the longer it drags out, the longer, the, the greater the possibility this ignites into World War III and a nuclear exchange. That is the way it is. I mean, Russia has been saying flat out that that's a possibility, and yet our leaders in the Pentagon say, nah, we're not concerned. Okay. Well, they've got that... Uh, Federal, what do they call it? The Federal Relocation Arc or whatever. There's there's a, a an arc of underground bunkers in the mountains, the Appalachians around Washington, D.C., where they get to go hide. The rest of us are just going to have to take our chances, I suppose. Um, this week, our Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, told Congress, this was on Tuesday, that Russia is involved in a, quoting now, military conflict with Ukraine and the West. This is essentially an acknowledgement of the U.S. role as a participant in the war. And uh, we've admitted that, yes, it was our intelligence that helped the Ukrainians sink Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva. Oh, yes, and it's our intelligence that's helping the Ukrainians kill Russian generals. Ukraine claims they've taken out 12 Russian generals so far, which has shocked observers because nobody thought that was a thing. I mean, that the Ukrainians had that kind of capacity. And obviously they don't because they're using American intelligence to do it. But secondly, that you'd find that many flag officers that close to the front. Well, um, we shall see. It is clearly not happening as quickly as observers thought it was going to, but It's been openly admitted now and reported by the corporate media that the goal of the United States government, the Biden administration and our allies is to drag this out as long as possible. Not good news if you are an average citizen of Ukraine. Uh, Inflation continues to uh, burn hot this week. The April CPI, Consumer Price Index, hit 8.5%, which was about four percentage points or four tenths of a percentage point higher than um, experts expected. Analysts thought that things had peaked in March, but uh, no, April was higher yet. Again, 40-year high, and uh, gasoline prices and diesel prices, according to AAA this week, now hitting all-time highs. Wherever you are, you're probably paying more than we are here in the Ozarks. We've got uh, some of the cheapest gasoline in the country, but we're still at about three ninety-five, three ninety-nine a gallon, depending on where you go. Um, Friends back in southern Illinois, four fifty-seven a gallon. This is unheard of. But there is some good news. Some good news, a ray of hope in all of this. While we are paying record prices for gasoline and inflation has hit a four-decade high, the Biden administration has, has successfully managed to lower the price of crack pipes. Yes, it is true. This was a story a few months ago, and of course the White House denied it. No, no, we're not giving out free crack pipes to anyone. The Washington Free Beacon, which is an online news source, leans conservative, reported this back in February. Jen Psaki, who, by the way, uh, spent her last day as White House press secretary on Friday. She's now joining MSNBC so she can take over and become their lowest rated show, I suppose. Um, She will no longer be circling back to reporters in the press briefing room. Uh, She denied that it was uh, a story. She said this was inaccurate reporting. There is no truth to the report that the uh, safe smoking kits being handed out to drug users would contain free crack pipes. Well, the Washington Free Beacon sent a reporter out and uh, actually did some, you know, reporting, actually went to some of these safe smoking places where safe smoking kits are being handed out to drug users and found that at every single one, uh, and this included, um, let's see, five 
harm reduction organizations calls to over two dozen more. And they said every every organization they visited, facilities in Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Richmond, Virginia, crack pipes were included in these safe smoking kits. So congratulations to the Biden administration. Um, not so good on gasoline and diesel, but for uh, their constituents addicted to addicted to crack, well, they've managed to lower the price there for um, their paraphernalia. Uh, sadly, some news from George Barna. He's a pollster. He's now at Arizona Christian University, uh, heads the Cultural Research Center there. A new report that uh, Barna has put out in a a survey of pastors across the United States and found that um, Christian pastors in America, only 37% of them hold a biblical worldview. Only 37% hold a biblical worldview. Now, the question is, how does he define that? Uh, He's done that uh, and asked, I think, the same question for um, decades now, a couple of decades. It's basically six basic tenets of Christian theology. Did Jesus live a sinless life? Was he born of a virgin? Was he literally resurrected? Um, Is Satan a literal entity and not uh, a concept, force, or symbol? You know, things like that. Things that should be Christianity 101. Uh, But you got to get six out of six to say that you hold a biblical worldview. These are all, again, basic tenets of Christianity. I was going to say Orthodox Christianity. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about the Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church. I mean, um, doctrinally sound, biblically based Christianity. You should be able to get six out of six, especially if you're the senior pastor of a church. 37% of pastors across all pastoral descriptions, 41% of senior pastors. But the numbers drag down. um, 28% of associate pastors hold a biblical worldview. And uh, one of the frightening revelations of this survey is that only 12% of children's and youth pastors, only 12% of children's and youth pastors in Christian churches in America today hold a biblical worldview. So the lesson from this parents, grandparents is that we need to train up our children and grandchildren in the way they should go. Because if we're, Counting on the youth pastor at the church where we're dropping off the kids on Sunday morning or Sundays and Wednesdays, it's a pretty good bet they're not getting biblically sound, doctrinally sound Christian theology as part of their teaching. We cannot count on the churches to teach the kids coming up what Christian doctrine is, why it's even relevant or important. We're in the middle of a supernatural war. And if we think most of the characters in the Bible, and I'm not saying this to imply that the stories in the Bible are fiction, I'm saying that the enemy described in the Bible is made up, is fiction, then kids will just move on to stuff that's a little more uh, entertaining and, um, I don't know, kind of reaffirms their bias, the stuff that they want to do. The thing is, if the Bible's properly taught... It is pretty, it is exciting on its own. You don't need to add anything to it. As a fiction writer, I've dabbled in it a little bit, you don't need any more of a palette than you've got with the Bible. That's why Sharon and I named our our most recent collaborative book, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, because they're all in there in the Bible, and God himself has confirmed that these entities are, in fact, real. Start teaching kids that. And they'll think it's, hey, this is like the Marvel Cinematic Universe on steroids. Well, sadly, that's not a new story coming from uh, Barna. It's just uh, kind of picking up steam over the last few decades. Uh, one archaeology story I want to share. This is really cool. It came out this week. Uh, Tom Horn spotted this and shared this with uh, Sharon and me and a few of our friends. And it is really cool. I shared it on Facebook this week. Uh, a place called Karahan Tepe, which is near... Gobekli Tepe. It's in the Haran region of uh, Southeast Turkey, which was, of course, Abraham's hometown. And um, it is contrary to what we've been told about Gobekli Tepe, which is supposed to be the world's oldest temple going back to about uh, 9,000 BC, 10,000 BC thereabouts. Karahan, Karahan Tepe is even older. It is, in the words of the author of this piece, 
astonish no no i'm sorry stupefyingly big stupefyingly big archaeologists have only excavated one percent of this site so far and um, even that one percent is really impressive so 99 percent is still buried under the earth um again stupefyingly big sean thomas is the author of this piece it was published in the the spectator in the uk spectator.co.uk um but here's the thing it's really interesting um judd burton dr judd burton who will be back next week as part of iron and myth four tell you about that in just a bit and uh, dr aaron judkins has been working on a book about gobekli tepe for quite some time now and we're praying praying that we'll see it before the end of this year um Gobekli Tepe has uh, yielded to archaeologists a number of skulls, skulls that were deliberately defleshed and carefully pierced with holes so they could um, apparently be hung and displayed. Now, this is not unknown in ancient Anatolia, which is what they used to call Turkey before the Turks. Um, Skull cults were a thing back in the Neolithic and this is all through the Levant, actually. If you want to really entertain yourself sometime, just Google the phrase Jericho skulls. Jericho skulls. Skulls like the Jericho skulls have been found up into ancient Anatolia. Anyway, um, the skulls might have come from conflict, according to the author of the piece, but it's also possible the skulls were obtained via human sacrifice because at a nearby slightly younger site called the Skull Building of Kayanu, C-A-Y-O-N-U. Archaeologists have found altars drenched with human blood, probably from human sacrifice. And then Thomas adds this, and this is what's really intriguing about this article. Uh, Another unnerving oddity, quoting from the piece, is the curious number of carvings which show people with six fingers. Is this symbolic or an actual deformity? Perhaps the mark of a strange tribe. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps mm, the Nephilim. I'm only half joking here. This is mentioned. The six finger anomaly is mentioned in 2 Samuel 21, verses 20 and 21. One of the men of great stature taken out by David and his men. This one in particular taken out by David's uh, nephew is described as having six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. But that's the only place in the Bible that that's mentioned. And now it's kind of it's kind of become like received wisdom that the Nephilim all have six fingers and six toes. No, it's just one verse in the Bible referring to one guy. Polydactyly, you know, having extra digits is not unknown among normal humans. The Chicago Cubs, not within the last 20 years, had a relief pitcher named Antonio Alfonseca. Antonio Alfonseca. He also pitched for the Marlins and uh, a few other teams. And if he was one of the Nephilim, it sure didn't help him pitch. I mean, he was okay. He he had one good year with the Marlins where he got like 30, 35 saves or something. But with the Cubs, he was meh. His nickname was uh, the Octopus because he had, you know, the extra finger. But that doesn't mean he has Nephilim DNA in his blood. In, In fact, as Sharon and I pointed out in our book, Veneration... The phrase translated in 2 Samuel, descendant of the giant, is uh, in Hebrew, it's Yelade ha rafa. And the, fr- the term there, the Hebrew word Yelade, does not mean literal blood descendant. It does not. It means uh, servant of, or devotee of, or one who is um, brought into a group through indoctrination or. Um, initiation. Uh, so in other words, it, it means that Goliath and his buddies were not necessarily, and I would say probably not literal Nephilim descendants, but they worshipped these, what they thought were g- spirits of the mighty men who were of old. They were demonic. It was a demonic warrior cult, basically which may have epigenetic um, changes, may make, may make some genetic changes in you. You know, Sharon has talked about that. But if we believe that God destroyed everything that walked the earth in the flood of Noah, then we got to get creative as to how 
um, the Giants came back. Well, anyway, I don't want to rabbit trail too far, but I just think this is interesting because this site, Karahan Tepe, and the sites around it predate the flood of Noah. There's no question about that. That's one of the points that Judd and Aaron plan to make in their book, showing the influence of the Watchers on the pre-flood world. Now, when we go to Turkey in the fall, uh, Sharon and I, we're going to be there with uh, Doug Hershey. You see the interview from a couple of weeks ago with uh, Doug about the uh, the tour of Turkey coming up October 18th through November 3rd. We will not be able to visit Karahan Tepe, I asked, but um, it is a working dig site and not really set up to handle tourists. But some of the uh, artifacts from Karahan Tepe have been taken to the Archaeology Museum in San Liurfa, and we will be going there. So... We will see some of the things that have been found at uh, Karahan Tepe, and really, really looking forward to that. Uh, you can find out more about the tour of Turkey if you're interested. Um, we're trying to keep it just a couple of dozen people so that uh, it's manageable. And this being our first time to Turkey, you know, we don't really know what to expect. Although those that we talked to have been there say that the Turkish government is really trying hard, and the Turkish people welcome Westerners. Turkish government really trying hard to develop the uh, archaeological history in their land. Karahan Tepe, Gobekli Tepe, much, much older than the pyramids of Egypt, like by eight or 10,000 years. Much, much older than Gilgal Rephaim by about seven to 9,000 years. Much older than Stonehenge by eight to 10,000 years each. So we're talking about a whole different period of history, again, pre-flood, and we're looking forward to getting over there and seeing it. We will go to Gobekli Tepe, by the way, as part of that uh, conference, or part of that uh, tour. Speaking of conferences, that's mind already shifting into the next gear here. Uh, We're going to be in uh, Colorado Springs next weekend. In fact, as uh, we uh, release the video for uh, next week's View from the Bunker, which is Iron and Myth 4, rejoined by Dr. Judd Burton, Brian Gadawa, and Pastor Doug Van Dorn. Um, we will be in Colorado Springs at the Prophecy Watchers Homeward Bound Conference. Now, if you haven't already made plans to go, uh, it's probably a little late for that. They may have some room yet, but I think it was close to a sellout. But you still can take advantage of streaming video. Prophecy Watchers offering streaming video for the conference. And uh, with the lineup of speakers, you don't want to miss any of these. L.A. Marzulli, uh, Ken Johnson, Ryan Peterson, um, Dr. Randall Price, speaking of archaeology, uh, Brent Miller Jr., he's always dynamic. Our good friend Doug Woodward, just on the program here recently, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis. And uh, I'll be speaking twice on this coming Friday. So Friday the 20th, once late afternoon, once in the evening. I'll be talking about... Um, Oh, what am I talking about? I better say I better figure that out between now and then. Hadn't I? Uh, the, the Mount Hermon, Mount of Olives connection, and also be talking about the Gog of Magog conflict and uh, what I'm calling Gog's um, diabolical double cross. So uh, that and more. You can find out more online about the streaming video at uh, prophecywatchers.com, prophecywatchers.com. Um, Skywatch TV's Defender Conference, by the way, is... Uh, on the web, it is uh, streaming now. It went uh, live on the web on Friday, early Friday morning. And for the second conference in a row, I set one of the preferences incorrectly for the streaming video, which made it confusing for people logging in. They were just getting the you know the images of the videos, but the videos weren't playing. You had to really navigate around to find the videos that played. My fault. My fault. Fixed it. So uh, it should be good to go. Uh, But you still got nearly 90 days to take advantage of it. And Tom Horn has added as a free bonus all of the Skywatch Films documentaries, all five of those documentary films, including Josh Peck's most recent, The Great Delusion. He's got a new one coming out very, very soon. We're going to shoot some, uh, in fact, they're recording programs on it uh, this coming week for Skywatch TV. Uh, And that'll be about um, Wormwood and Apophis. So that should be fascinating. Um, Anyway, if you want to take advantage of the time remaining through April or through August 13th of 2022, access to two dozen presentations and uh, all five of those documentary films, 
Log on to DefenderConference.com. In July, we'll be going to the Go Therefore Conference. This is uh, Pastor Mike Spaulding's conference at the Harvest Revival Center in Brookville, Ohio, just outside Dayton. We'll be there with uh, a number of old friends. Pastor Carl Gallup's old in the sense we've known them for a while. Um, Dr. Michael Lake, David Hevner, who's uh, just launching uh, his last evangelist series, which he describes as um, CSI meets the Book of Revelation. That uh, sounds like fascinating stuff. He's going to be a guest on an upcoming episode here, by the way, of A View from the Bunker, talking about that uh, project. Kenny C., Tom Dunn, Pastor Casper McLeod, Neil Peterson. Find out more and sign up online at gothereforeconference.com, gothereforeconference.com. Told you about our tour in October, but next spring you can join us in Israel as Sharon and I go with our colleagues from Skywatch TV, Donna Howell and Allie Henson, co-hosts of the Simply His program with Catherine Horn and Nita Horn. This uh, is a tour of Israel like no other. We will see Joshua's altar where there was that uh, recent find of the lead curse tablet, Shiloh, Bethel, Gilgal, Rephaim, and uh, we're really, really going to do our best to get up on top of the uh, serpent mound of Bashan, seeing as how it's only a quarter of a mile from Gilgal, Rephaim. uh, Yeah, it's huge. It makes the great serpent mound in Ohio look well, quite small by comparison. It's uh, three times longer, five times higher, and covered with megalithic tombs. And you can see Mount Hermon from there, which is not coincidental. Well, uh, find out more at uh, skywatchinisrael.com. The uh, itinerary is posted online, and there's a place for you to sign up, uh, reserve your spot anyway. The uh, tour of Israel, March 19th through 30th of 2023. And do take advantage of the optional three-day extension over into Jordan, because... um, Seeing Petra is a bucket list item. It is absolutely stunning. But the importance of the view from Mount Nebo, both historically, because that's where Moses got his only look at the promised land, and prophetically, think War of Gog and Magog. Yeah, don't miss that. Skywatchinisrael.com. Take advantage of our uh, new mobile app. This uh, mobile app is the same developer that Skywatch TV uses for its mobile app. And uh, since I've been responsible for setting that one up, it was just a simple thing for us to say, hey, can you do one for us too? This is with Tom and Joe Horn's blessing. We are flying alongside Skywatch TV, not flying away from Skywatch TV. So uh, add the uh, Gilbert House Ministries app, or GHTV as we're calling it. Uh, You'll get... This weekly podcast, plus our weekly Bible study, audio only, the Gilbert House Fellowship, plus our two weekly television programs, Unraveling Revelation and Sci Friday. Both of those delivered right to your smartphone or tablet, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire. But you can also add the Roku channel to your Roku stick and uh, get us up on the big screen that way. Um, We've got a link at vftb.net in the top menu bar. You can also find it at gilberthouse.org gilberthouse.org there's a link for the app a link for the Roku uh, uh, app and uh, Roku channel and uh, just go ahead and take advantage of it they are free and um, just keeps us connected and bypasses the gatekeepers of social media because you never know when the uh, video streaming services will decide to you know you said something we didn't like well the company that develops this app and the Roku channel Christian channel no problems with our content so Cuts out the middleman. Thank you for taking time to watch or listen to A View from the Bunker, wherever it happens to be. Uh, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever else fine podcasts are sold. And uh, we hope you take a moment to give us a like at uh, our View from the Bunker page at Facebook. Our announcer is DC Good. And A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.